Hello, I'm Phil Nash, and I'm going to take you through some of the new features in Sea Lion 2017.1. So let's get started. So we have a project here to showcase a few of the new features, and we'll start by noting that this is a catch test project. In this main source file, we just include catch and configure it to provide a version of main for us. We also have other test files that we'll get to shortly. If we run this project without any special setup, Catch will run in a standard executable, and by default, just write its normal console output to the built-in console window. But now CLion has Catch integration, we can go much further. Let's add a test configuration. There's now a config type for Catch projects. So let's give that a name and set the target. We now run that again, we see the test navigation and output windows. By default, we're only seeing failing tests, but we can show the passing ones too by clicking this icon. Note that we see a hierarchy here. Catch has sections that can nest to arbitrary depth, and that structure is reflected in the navigator. But for now, we're interested in that failing test. If we click on that, we see the failure report on the right. Clicking on the file and line number takes us to the assertion that's failing. We can see that we're testing the value of this variable, and it's clearly not 42. It'd be nice to know what value it's getting in the test, and we can see that in the test report down here. It's 54. And if we click through to the definition, we see it's been computed from a product of 6 and 9. And that would actually work, but only if we're dealing with base 13. Now, maybe we don't want to commit to base 13 here, so let's make this a variable template. This is a C14 feature that C line now supports. Let's go back to the test code and fix that up. Now, this doesn't fix the problem yet because we're still using decimal. So let's bring in a number base implementation. And we'll use base 13 here. We'll need to compare against a string because base 13 may have extra digits. And now to rerun just the failing test, we can click this icon here and we're green. So let's see what other code we have here. In this file, we're in the middle of implementing a couple of template functions for finding the middle element in a vector. It's simple enough, but the code is very noisy. So while we're all green, let's see if we can refactor a bit to clean it up. We start the test by declaring a vector of strings and a vector of ints. We then have two sections. You can think of catch sections as dependent test cases. In the first, we get the middle element by iterator. Spelling these iterator types out in full here is very noisy, but if we auto enter on them, we get a new intention action, replace type with auto. This is a quick and easy way to modernize your code base. Just do it with care so you don't lose useful information. As a bonus, our auto declarations now neatly line up too. The return type from the function can be made auto as well, and CLine now understands this. Now let's look at the second section. This time we're getting the middle value. While we can convert these variables to auto too, we need to be careful to preserve the references for string, because auto always deduces without ref. If we want to be more uniform or more general, we can make these decl type autos instead. And this will infer the exact type being returned, including the refs. And we can do the same for the return type. And put it in postfix too, if we like. Now, we might look at this and wonder why we need to return ints by const reference. If we introduce a little helper, we can choose a const ref or by value, depending on whether the type is a scalar or not. And we can put a couple of static asserts in there just to prove to ourselves that this is actually happening. And for a final example in this project, we have a builder object that we're progressively populating. But when we get to needing to look up an address, we need to make an asynchronous call here. And this is implemented as a function that takes a lambda to call us back on when it's ready. Well, this seems to work, but note that we're capturing our builder here, which is a local variable, by reference. If the async callback is made after we exit the function, we'll have a dangling reference. So we could change it to capture by value, but that doesn't seem very efficient, especially as we no longer need the original. Well, C++14 gives us the ability to use move semantics, 
for its generalized lambda capture syntax. We'll also need to make the lambda itself mutable now. And now we're both safe and efficient, and with CLINE's updated C14 support, our code analysis is clear too. Now, if we want to find more examples of builders, we might want to do a text search with Find in Path. And this has a new, reorganized pop up window. The live preview is now more prominent, and you can see the results of any changes immediately. You can still open in the Find window, but you may find you need to do that less often. And now we're in the data model. Notice that it's using nested namespaces, a feature new to C17, and the first C17 feature that CLINE supports. In this next example, we have a new project, and this project has a dependency on an external library. But we don't have the source code, only a lib and a header. So let's see what happens now when we try to debug this code. If we step into this function of the library, we go into a disassembly view. We can keep single stepping, and if we step far enough, we start to see local variables being updated. And of course, we can step back out at any point and see the final result. Note that this feature is currently only available when using GDB as the debugger. Now, on Windows, we've started to add support for the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler. In settings, you can set Visual Studio as part of the toolchain, and on the CMake page, there are now additional settings to things like architecture and platform. Note that this is experimental at this stage and still has a few limitations, and you'll need to set a registry value before you can use it. And finally, if you've used a Swift plugin before, you'll know that it can be a little involved to get your project set up for the first time. Well, no more. There's now better integration with the plugin, and Swift projects can be created directly from the new project dialog. This sets up the cmakelist.txt file with all the target options set properly, and creates a package file necessary for it to build. And in the code, new refactorings are supported, including create from usage. Of course, there is more than we've covered here, so please see the What's New blog post for more details. As ever, thanks for watching, and remember that new users can download a 30-day free trial.